I think we had a very illuminating uh, discussion on the first panel about the financial system itself, but uh, the financial system resides in a uh, financial regulatory uh, framework. And uh, ever since the crisis, there have been uh, many reforms to the financial system, understandably uh, so. Um, policymakers are concerned about it. Um, however, the delicate balance of ensuring that there is discipline in the system while also ensuring that the system is robust and vibrant to propel economic growth is very challenging. And uh, this next panel will explore these issues more fully and help us understand how financial reforms can support economic growth. My colleague, Hester Peirce, will moderate this panel. Hester is the director of the Financial Markets Working Group at the Mercator Center at George Mason University. She has worked for the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, where she worked in regulatory reforms after the crisis. She has also served at the SEC as staff attorney and counsel. She currently serves on the Investor Advisory Committee, which advises the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, I'm excited and very pleased to welcome Hester Peirce and our second group of panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And, um Thanks to the panel for being here today. As, as we heard in the first panel, finance is, is very important to both economic growth and innovation. And one of the things that's been mentioned is that the diversity of the financial system in the United States is really, um, really marks us out. It's really something different. And so from small community banks to the capital markets to big <coughs> banks, they all have a role to play, uh, an important role to play in finance. And so one of the things that, that we need to think about is how regulation will affect the way financial markets work. If you get it wrong, you pay the price in economic growth. If you get it right, you can have a financial system and an economy that are vibrant. And our panel will, be, will work us through these issues um, today. Uh, our panel, everyone has an international twist. Um, so we'll be talking about not only what's going on domestically, but some of the international developments in regulation. Barbara Frohn, at, at the end, is a senior advisor at the Institute of International Finance. In that capacity, she spearheads efforts related to prudential regulatory issues. Um, and she brings to that position not only the, abil the ability to speak five languages. We've told her she's only allowed to speak English today. <laughs> um, but she also brings a wealth of diverse private sector experience to that position. Next to her is Hal Scott, who's a professor at Harvard Law School, and he's also the author of a book on international finance, a textbook, and he's also the director of the Committee on Capital Markets Regulation. And that, um, that committee has been a really important voice in many of the big policy debates that we've had uh, following the crisis. Next to him is Michael Silva. Uh, Mike is the chief regulatory officer at GE Capital. And before that, he had a really long and, and uh, impressive career at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York with a little detour to uh, help out in Iraq, um, advising the central bank there in Iraq. So he's seen financial crises and other types of crises. And next to him is Phil Swagel, who is at the University of Maryland. He is um, a professor of international economic policy. And he earned his... Um, credentials during the financial crisis at Treasury. I'm not an enviable position to be in, but um, can speak to us from that experience as well. So Phil, I'm going to start with you. Um, you wrote in 20, at the end of 2013, you wrote regarding the Volcker Rule that you thought that regulators and legislators had really understood that there was a trade-off between, on the one hand, financial stability, and then on the other hand, economic growth and efficiency. So now we have a little more hindsight. There's been a little bit more implementation. What do you think in terms of policymakers getting that balance right between economic efficiency and growth on the one hand and then um, financial stability on the other? OK. Um, I, I mean, we're still working at that balance. And we can see developments even over the last, what, six months or a year. right? So I, I, I kind of feel like we're moving toward a better balance still. right? There's a natural. Uh, over swing of the pendulum, so to speak, right before the crisis, too easy credit after the crisis, um, probably too much of a reaction. 
Um, I mean, I look at the, the repeal of the, the so-called Lincoln Amendment last year as a, a step in the right direction, right? Uh, removing a provision in the law that, that really uh, added costs and, and didn't have concomitant benefits. So that's a, this is a good step. I look at what the Fed has done with the, the Volcker Rule to say, um, uh, we will keep examining this, right? And the Volcker Rule, I, I, you, you didn't mention, I, I, at one point I written that the Volcker Rule was a solution in search of a problem, which I think still makes a lot of sense. Um, but the Fed has done a reasonably good job with it to make sure it's not, it's not as bad as it could be, I guess is the way to say it. And, and they've committed to, um, uh, to, to revisiting. So that's, that's a hopeful sign that at least there's, there's recognition of this trade-off that, uh, that you highlighted and, and a willingness to, to keep going and, and try to, to, to improve on it. So maybe at some point we can get to removing the the solutions that were in search of a problem and <laughs> focusing on problems that are in search of solutions. Yeah. Um, Mike, your, your company has been in the news of late. Um, GE announced this spring that it would be spinning off GE Capital. And a Wall Street Journal article reporting about it noted that one of the things driving it was um, the post-crisis regulatory reforms, which has really imposed costs on companies that make it difficult to, to earn a return. So I want to ask you about that. I mean, obviously, GE Capital was designated by the Financial Stability Oversight Council as systemically important. And so that added a whole new layer of regulation. But what role did regulation play in um, the decision that GE made? And what lessons can we draw more broadly from, from what's going on with your company? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I should say, actually, GE decided not to spin off GE Capital, but to essentially wind it down to about 20% of its current size, sell off the assets. And uh, did, uh, did regulatory uh, burdens and uh, costs play a role in that decision? Yes, they were a factor, but there were three much larger factors. Uh, the, the, the first of which is that investors have been telling GE for some time that if they undervalue GE stock because of its association with the, the financial industry the, and the volatile earnings there, they, they assign GE a lower uh, multiple than they assign other pure industrial companies. So that's so for that reason, uh, Jeff Immel had been walking a, uh, back a bit on GE Capital for some time. Uh, next big factor was that last year, uh, GE Capital spun off its retail division, Synchrony Bank. And we were very surprised at how well Synchrony stock did once it was out from under GE Capital. It really took off. And that really put the thought in our mind that perhaps the financial assets might be much more valued out from under GE. And then the third factor was, sure enough, we began to get a lot of inbound inquiries uh, uh, about our assets. And, and those three things really are what came together to produce this, this decision it went to, to, uh, to, to, in a more abrupt way, uh, uh, complete the course that GE Capital, GE had already set sail on. Now, all that said, were regulatory uh, pressures and costs a factor? Yes, they were. And there, there is a, a, a cautionary tale there. They weren't the primary factor, but GE um, Capital has one investor, GE, and that investor had options with what it could do with its capital, and it decided to do other things with its capital, in part, as uh, Jeff Immelt was just talking about this on Charlie Rose the other night, because of the degree to which the regulatory burdens had depressed the return on capital. So, um, uh, you know, banks also have investors, and those investors have choices. And, and, I, and I think that it, it's conceivable that at some point you reduce the return on capital in, in the banking industry to a certain, a certain degree that, that you'll see those investors begin to exercise their choices. Um, so, Hal has also thought quite a bit about regulatory costs. And um, a recent report from your committee talked about the liquidity rules and about the fact that Regulators are really guessing as to whether these rules will work in another crisis. And in the meantime, we're seeing that potentially they're having a bad effect on economic growth, a negative, negative impact. And so, Hal, maybe you can talk a little bit about whether we're relying maybe too much now on regulatory guesswork. Maybe we're, we're being a little bit too cautious about risk taking, something that was talked about in the first panel. Um, are you concerned about that? Yes, well, let me start with the fact that I'd say maybe uh, on a scale of one to 10, we've spent 10 uh, trying to assess the rules on capital and one trying to assess the rules on liquidity. And it may turn out that the liquidity rules have much more of an economic impact than the capital rules. We need to learn a lot more about it. Second point I would say is that 
there is an issue of liquidity in good times and there's an issue of liquidity in bad times. And both of those have an economic impact. So in good times, I think we're seeing a concern in the marketplace that whether it's produced by gen general market conditions, by the Fed's uh, super supply of liquidity, or by regulation in the form of a local rule or leverage requirements, there's a, an increasing concern in all, uh, all parts of the financial system over liquidity. And this is in an ongoing market. And why is that important? Because less liquidity, the spreads increase, the cost to investors increase, the cost of issuance treasuries increase because they're less liquid, et cetera. So in good times, uh, you know, we could impede economic growth by over-regulating liquidity. In bad times, uh, we need to worry about whether there's adequate liquidity. Uh, our, uh, restrictions we put on the Fed may, uh, in terms of lending to the increasingly important non-bank sector, may decrease the ability of them to function as a lender of last resort and supply liquidity in a crisis. And, you know, if they don't supply liquidity in a crisis, we have huge economic impact because the economy shuts down. We go into recession and even depression. So I would just sum this all up, say it's incredibly important that we understand the impact of the various measures we are taking on liquidity, but we have only scratched the surface, really, in understanding it. And Barbara, I think you've been part of the effort to try to understand what the effects are of these different rules. Um, you've thought a lot about what Basel capital rules and what liquidity rules uh, will do for, for economic growth both positive and negative, and maybe you could touch on that. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm not that worried about Basel III. Uh, what I'm seriously worried about is the future regulation, and for two reasons. One, on the market side, uh, because what I've seen very much is um, that regulation has been developed and is being developed as we speak in silos, so per topic, so recovery and resolution, capital liquidity, accounting rules but also actually per uh, type of financial institutions. So you have the insurers, the asset managers, uh, banks, um, the, the money market funds. But actually what I'm very worried about is that there has been very little coordination. So actually the question is who's going to bear the risk in the end? What kind of systemic risks uh, will uh, emerge as a result of uh, economic agents try, trying to play another role in the markets? And uh, what will be the behavior of changes? So in the past, and, and this is something that we discuss in the IAF board with, uh, where we have asset managers and insurers and, uh, and bank uh, CEOs and chairmen. In the past, you used to have the, let's say, the money uh, makers and the algorithmic uh, traders, and they, they would step out when there were, was volatility, and the dealers would step in, and then they would sell it on to um, insurance companies and pension funds, and that will all radically change. So I think it's very important to... Uh, to, to to be very much aware of what the future roles of all those different groups. And that is a serious uh, issue because especially with accounting standards and new insurance rules, that will change. The other thing that I'm really worried about is Basel IV. So what is Basel IV? Well, Basel IV is actually uh, the fact that there are still 12 capital standards or capital related standards uh, in the making at Basel. Uh, and they, they are uh, to be applied to banks. And those capital standards have the potential of radically changing the business model and the portfolio strategies of banks. So there's something about interest rate risk in the banking book, a new capital treatment for sovereign debt. But actually the most important change is that there will be restrictions on the use of internal models. And there will be capital floors. So we have done a lot of research on that and we were using real data and also real loss and default data from a representative group of large international banks. And what we found, first of all, um, is that obviously capital requirements will, will go up tremendously, up to 300% uh, on average for all uh, asset classes with these new uh, rules. Um, but that is actually... That's a problem because already nowadays the uh, return on capital is way below uh, the, the cost of capital. So that's already a problem. But why is it a serious problem for everybody? Is that because the new approaches take a sort of a one size fits all approach. So actually um, it's, um, it's reverting to the mean. And what we found is that actually the high quality assets are being unduly penalized. 
And so uh, this means that actually there's a perverse incentive for banks to go to the very uh, high risk assets. And, uh, and we saw that it could go up the capital up to 10 times more capital for those high quality assets. And that was even without taking into account the real loss and default data. So you get a little bit of a, uh, the real history being completely divorced and the real risk completely divorced from regulatory capital. And that's a serious issue. However, will banks indeed going uh, into the uh, lower, uh, lower quality assets, that would actually be good for the, the, the fintech companies that we were just talking about in the startups. Well, they won't, because they also have an internal constraint, which is the risk management internal view constraint. And they also look at um, the, the volatility of earnings. So in the end, what we found with our research is that they will just focus on just a few asset classes, and they will deleverage. And I don't think that is in the interest of anybody because I don't believe that peer-to-peer -peer lenders and funds can completely absorb the new incentive for banks to deleverage. So that, those are my two concerns. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that, those concerns? I, just, I, had, I had a thought. It's, it's not, not on those concerns, but on the liquidity, um, which was, uh, I, first of all, I thought what, what House said is exactly right. Um, and it, it, it Tied into Volcker, right? Which, if if you know, if I said that the Fed has done you know as good a job as it could, well, the thing is still there, and I think that's a really important topic for future um, research uh, is the liquidity impact of what of what we have. Um, and then second, I'm just thinking of like the Fed's what they're doing with the LCR with the liquidity coverage rule. Um, you know, again, I, I realize they're trying to get this right, but I look at the uh, the press reports that they're going to allow uh, municipal securities uh, into that, and I. You know, and sometimes I can I can just imagine the pressure they're under from um, right both whether it's from industry or from sort of um, uh, you know municipal issuers to include that, and it just seems like right if the Fed's going to be independent, right, not just on monetary policy but also on, on regulatory policy, this would be a good um, this is a good place to see whether they use their uh, their regulatory or their their statutory independence. Um, it's sort of interesting. Dr. Johnson touched this morning on his conversations with the Bulgarian banker who talked about the, the government being the one to make capital allocation decisions. And it sort of sounds, some of what you all are saying, sort of yeah. sounds like government is displacing private yeah. market incentives. Well, you know, what you're talking about sounds like back to the future. Let's yes. go back to Basel I. Yes, that's actually and, what we okay, found, the, so to be honest. The, you know, when we went back to the future, when we yeah. said we should have a leverage ratio, yes. okay, uh, yeah. even though we have risk-based capital. So yeah. what we're sort of going towards is the system of capital regulation we had before there was any Basel process, okay? Yeah. And we've learned a lot, like, you know, different assets have different risks. Uh, governments can't decide. I used to say that, you know, the communists tried to figure out how, what the price of goods was. You know, they didn't do a very good job on that. Trying for the government to say what the price of risk is exactly. is an incredibly more complicated task, and they're even worse at that. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is the direction we seem to be going yeah. at because what underlies this is the distrust of the bank's models because they're going to act in their self-interest. Yeah. Well, there's another way to deal with that, which is to look at the models, OK? <laughs> and have a process, an uh, interactive process. Is your model working? Is it you know, reliable, et cetera? Rather than going back, no models will just have the government yeah. decide how risky assets are. Now, yeah, maybe to say is actually, and this is even worse, um, somebody was saying, so the US government will decide who gets credit. But I think with Basel IV, it's actually Basel who decides to get credit. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of the reasons why my, actually my third concern is that uh, there won't be global alignments because we are in a period of low or stagnating growth. So there's not much incentive for many jurisdictions to really play ball with these new rules because that would definitely uh, impede on economic growth and especially in emerging markets. We already hear them grumbling and in the end overall uh, global financial stability and, and trade will be uh, jeopardized. Well, maybe that's the market speaking, um, saying we don't want these rules. Mike, you were at the Fed, so can you talk a little bit about what Hal said about are the regulators capable of really assessing banks' internal models and kicking the tires and seeing if they're effective? Uh, 
Uh, certainly to some degree, a absolutely. And uh, I mean, that's tough talent to get, but um, uh, they're trying to acquire it. Um, but I think the regulators would tell you themselves, this is not their ideal role. But unfortunately, it's a role that a very serious situation has sort of forced them into, which is, um, as you mentioned, I was at, you know, at the Fed during the crisis. I was Tim's chief of staff, and I witnessed firsthand the struggle policymakers had in you know, very dark hours there, um, and, and frankly, how scary those cir circumstances were and how close we came, and how important it is that we never get in that place again. Um, and that's what I think regulators have done a good job of. Um, I do believe that the additional capital, additional liquidity, additional um, uh, activity restrictions, and so forth, have made it much less likely that we'll be in a crisis. Has there been unintended consequences? Sure, there's, there's just no way to do something like that perfectly. But it's such an important social goal um, that I, I and, and again, I'm probably too scarred by my experience, but I, I'm inclined to err on the side. Now, I'll say in terms of unintended consequences, turning off our phones, they actually interfere with the mics, so that was an unintended consequence. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if I may react to that, sure. let me be very clear. I think Basel III had a lot of good uh, stuff in it. And uh, um, if we can really analyze well the cumulative effect of the different Basel III standards, then it's manageable. It was Basel IV that I'm con concerned about, and don't that is overstepping the mark. And what I think, uh, there is one thing that we have always said uh, in, in my bank, um, I'm uh, actually uh, in Santander in Spain, is that it's important to set a tolerance level for failure of, of financial institutions. You can't just set it at zero because then you build a tank and, and we all know that tanks do not drive very well and they don't drive fast. So you, you have to set the tolerance level and that fundamental question hasn't really been asked, and also in, in, in the regulatory capital, how much model risk do you find acceptable? Those discussions have been, haven't been had, and I think that is where we, what Basel IV should be, not just trying to, uh, to, to do something about the symptoms of the new disease that come out of all, all this, this uh, situation with market liquidity. We should go back to the basis. I think there is a fear of um, risk in general. <coughs> Regulators are, were burned, um, I think, last time. They feel they want to protect themselves from ever being in, in that kind of situation again. Do, do any of you want to speak to maybe the tools that regulators will have in the next crisis? We just saw this week uh, there was a decision from the Court of Federal Claims about AIG and, and essentially said that what happened in that case was that the Fed overstepped its bounds. Um, and then there's also been a lot of conversation about uh, Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, which was used during the last crisis to, to rescue AIG. Um, do, do any of you want to weigh in on what it'll look like during the next crisis, Hal? Well, I've been, uh, and our committee is uh, very concerned about the restrictions that were put on Dodd-Frank uh, on the Fed uh, as a result of the crisis, uh, in my view, conflating the actual fiscal bailouts that were done by through TARP with the lender of last resort uh, power of the Federal Reserve, which goes back to the creation of the Federal Reserve. It's why the Fed was created in 1913, because there was no effective lender of last resort in the panic of 1907. And what Dodd-Frank did is it restricted the ability of the Fed in a number of different ways to lend the non-bank sector. And we've heard uh, more recently even further uh, cries for further restrictions, the so-called Warren Vitter bill that has been introduced, which uh, uh, would do a number of bad things. Uh, among others, it would give the CFPB and uh, the Federal Trade Commission the power to stop the Fed from lending to institutions, because each of these agencies would actually have to certify that the lender, the borrower was solvent, which of course they're in no position to do. And so the, the whole non-bank sector, which played an enormous role in the crisis and will play an increasing role in our financial system as a result of a large part because the regulation is forcing a lot of the intermediation out of the formal banking sector into other institutions. So you saw Goldman Sachs now getting into consumer lending just the other day. This is kind of a go, go across the board. So um, I'm very concerned with the inability or the, the potential inability of the Fed to be a, an effective last, a wonder of last resort in a new crisis. And Mike, you were 
there in the midst of the last crisis? Do you have thoughts? Sure. Uh, yes, I do. First of all, I, I think that was extremely well said. And if I could just build off it for a moment. Um, as I said a moment ago, I, I do think that, um, the regulators have done a, a good job of, of making a, another financial crisis less likely. But I also think it's, it's essentially impossible that we've seen our last financial crisis. And I, and I do worry that the next time we have a financial crisis, an institution under stress, we created circumstances that will accelerate that. And what I mean is that, um, you know, I've sort of been swimming around in the private sector for about 18 months now, and it's been very interesting. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversations I've had. And people talk to you differently than uh, when you you know, have the Federal Reserve label. And it's very clear to me we have a generation of traders and risk managers um, uh, and, and uh, 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 treasurers who know the following things very well. They know bad things can happen very fast. They know the next time bad things happen, white knights are going to be less, luck, uh, less likely because those didn't fare so well the last time. They know that the Fed is going to have significantly more constraints on it than it did last time. And finally, they, they know there's this thing out there called the Order Liquidation Authority. And you know, they, they have a, a generally a pretty good understanding of how it's supposed to work. Uh, but, but there's some skepticism that it will work. But, but they know this, even if it does work, the best result will be cents on the dollar after some period of time. Um, so what I worry about uh, is that we've created a set of circumstances where the, the first time uh, there begins to be some concern about the viability of any particular institution, people have a lot of incentives to actually run harder and faster. Totally agree with that. Um, and, and I think that could be a problem. Now, Phil, you've thought about the political economy of the last crisis. You also were in the midst of it, so maybe you have some thoughts to add as well. Right. No, I was just um, I was uh, thinking of the the moment when sort of all of a sudden you're you're doing what with the exchange stabilization fund, right? This is to, <laughs> to, back, to back the money market mutual funds, and that and so, so that, well, that power is gone. That's gone, right? So that's gone <laughs> exactly. Um, and that was bookended by the the you know when um, uh, uh, the the um, guarantee was announced to the, the industry, and they said, what, you're charging us for that? <laughs> they're equally upset. So um, I think those days are gone. It's just like what, what Hal said, that the, the, the flexibility is gone. On the other hand, um, you know, the, the great unknown, I, I agree with Mike, is Title II. That if Title II works, and we won't really know until the next crisis, I think that, that will do a lot um, to, to um, ameliorate the, the restrictions, right? And again, if it works, so the key word there is if. But imagine the next AIG, right? So you know, who knows if the court case will be upheld on appeal and all that. I guess there's appeals in both directions. Um, uh, right, AIG um, right, comes to the Fed and says, look, we're out of, we're out of cash. We can't make our calls. And they say, OK, that's fine. You know, we're, you know, bankruptcy doesn't work. Right? They're required to, to, to say that first. So we're doing Title II. And then um, they can put in money. So it's just like the, the Fed, New York Fed doesn't need to set up Maiden Lane, whatever. And um, they put in money. And stabilize the fund, uh, the, the firm. But then it, all the counterparties know that they, they're going to take losses later, right? They're required by law, and we don't know how that's going to work, and who, and which international counterparties. So there's all these open questions, but the law is there. The law is really clear, right? And at least it's clear that I think it can be. Um, so I, I think it's there. And uh, one last thought here is that it's striking to me that many people, not not the, those of us up here, but many people, talk as if Title II doesn't exist. Right? I mean, the Richmond Fed just put out an analysis yeah. of the safety net, which pretends that Title II doesn't exist. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Um, and now it has a footnote saying, we realize Title II is there, but it's not in the numbers. So um, I, anyway, to me, that's the great unknown, is will it work? I think it can, but will it, will it work? So I don't know if the others And, and yeah. nobody's going to know it's going to work, no, no. Uh, specifically for a large institution. Uh, imagine you're the Secretary of Treasury and Jamie Dimon gives you a call and says, well, J.P. Morgan's about to go under her. And you say, oh, no problem. Let's put them in OLA. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's like incredulous. Yeah, um, yeah. So no one wants it, right? No yeah, one wants to be Because, I mean, yeah. we have no experience with this thing, yeah. especially mm -hmm. for a large institution. Yeah. But I think, uh, to be honest, also, uh, we, we have been fighting uh, the last war. That, that was actually good, because that war probably won't happen then, uh, as much. Mm -hmm. Or if it happens, then at least it might be. Um, managed in a more orderly fashion. The point is, I think, the, the new crisis could be completely different. For instance, a, a payments crisis because of cybercrime. I mean, I do see that. Um, or uh, runs on peer-to-peer on -peer lending platforms. I also think that is not completely unrealistic. 
And actually here in the US, I mean, I'm a European, what really strikes me as very odd is this bifurcated approach you have on the, the too big to fill institutions and the, the global uh, systemically important financial institutions versus the ones that are just below the radar. Um, I, in Spain, in the middle of the crisis, I was there and I saw the herd behavior of the smaller banks doing all the same and that caused a systemic risk crisis. And so I, I think that is extremely dangerous. So I do see a crisis coming from there as well. It will be perhaps less contagion, but the herd behavior will still make it very, uh, very harsh. Well, I think that you all are a little bit more optimistic than I am about the state of, of Dodd-Frank reforms. I, one thing I worry about is that we've placed, and not only Dodd-Frank, but I think the capital reforms as well, but we've placed a lot of faith in regulators um, to get things right. Um, and, and so even with OLA, for example, it's taking us out of a process of bankruptcy, which we understand fairly well, even though, of course, big bankruptcies are messy, and putting us into this unknown world of OLA. We're not sure how it will work out. Um, but so that's my personal gripe with Dodd-Frank. Do, um, do you all have pieces of the, the post-crisis reforms that you think are particularly worrisome? Um, are there pieces that you think are particularly good? Uh, well, I've already said that I, I think the worst thing in Dodd-Frank at the restrictions put on the Fed is lender of last resort. I don't get enough publicity, but uh, could really come back and bite us. But I said next on my list is basically the failure of Dodd-Frank to address what I think all of us would believe is the most dysfunctional organization of the regulatory structure in the world. Um, and, um, you know, we just added to the complexity. We put a Band-Aid on it by creating this FSOC, okay, which is supposed to coordinate regulation among agencies who are independent, and therefore FSOC itself can't really tell these agencies what to do. You know, I think it's uh, a, a big failure of Dodd-Frank uh, not to take a serious look. I know Senator Dodd and Senator Shelby actually did look at this, um, and the politics sort of went over, it wasn't conducive to making reform, but we are still sitting there with a very dysfunctional regulatory structure. Paul Volcker came out with the report recently. Our committees authored it, uh, reports. Paulson had his blueprint. We've been all over this. I mean, there's almost a consensus of experts. This regulatory structure is dysfunctional. A lot of politics and uh, other things prevent uh, reform. I think we really need yeah. to address this. I, I would strongly agree with, with both of those. Um, and again, being on this side, I, experiencing this wall of regulators is, is, is quite, uh, quite daunting. Uh, to those, I would also add, um, just in general, that somehow Dodd-Frank came together in a way where what we have is the four largest banks continue to grow at a, at a pretty, uh, pretty good clip. And uh, the smaller banks, less than 10 billion or so, are shrinking. Um, somehow that's an unfortunate result. That's the safer end of the banking system. That's the part that fuels so much of the uh, economic growth and small jobs. And uh, that that top four uh, continues to grow at the rate it does um, is, is, is worrisome. And, and it's too bad that Dodd-Frank didn't somehow find a way to prevent but that result. Maybe also to, to react to uh, the lender of last resort. I mean, I was the uh, personal advisor to the CEO of Banco Santander in the middle of the crisis. And um, the lender of last resort in the crisis was so important and people really needed it. That said, people think that then, oh, you know, you just banks won't do their job because they'll just go to the central bank. But there's a very big stigma in using the lifeline of the central bank. We never did. But obviously, in many Spanish banks, Italian banks, they needed it. And actually, even in the UK, the UK central bank forced the banks to take it. And um, in that sense, I also think what is uh, very important is not to be too harsh on repo lending. In a crisis, what, if there's mistrust between the economic agents, then the only thing that is left is secured lending. And repo are used as secured lending. So actually, many Spanish banks actually only could still go to the market with repo lending. And repo lending was also crucial for the market making on the sovereign debt side. Without repos, you can't put something in the market. So we shouldn't be too, too harsh on these things. The lender of last resort is important. The repos are very important. And we, we can't completely just say, OK, let's cut it off. I was just thinking about on the FSOC that um, the importance of, of the leadership there. 
Um, I mean, it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's as effective as it could be. Um, the, the political side is, is an issue. Um, I, I think the debate, the coming debate on SIFI de-designation, de right, SIFIs that are, should no longer be SIFIs, that will be an important show of leadership. And leadership to say, you know, look, we, you know, we get it, the political pressure is to, you know, be harsh on large institutions, but to say stick with the substance. Um, and so that, that will be a key position for the next president um, to, uh, you know, the, the Treasury Secretary is the head of, of the FSOC. Um, uh, you know, some of, some of it is working. I mean, working, working you know, by the standards of, um, of our system. I mean, I think the derivatives provisions, you know, they're not perfect, but the transparency, the move to clearinghouses, um, exchanges. That is probably something that, that should have been done, and so that's that's a good part of Dodd Frank. I was gonna say the other thing that's obviously um, out there is still housing finance reform, which um, you know is just a, f a failure of uh, of the reform. Well, I think the panel has given us a lot to think about. I, I think we we may not uh, be satisfied that our regulatory system is working properly to. Um, to make the econom economy grow the way it, it could to its potential. So we all have a lot of work to do. Um, and I hope that the regulators we hear from next will tell us that they're hard at work trying to fix things. Thank you all very much. Thank you.